just saying on that. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Michael Bailey. Yes. Hello. Hi. Oh, let me just I'm gonna hit that wave button. Everybody's getting that wave button today. So we are going to be talking about cannabis legalization. Oh, hold on. Waiting for Jess. She actually just sent me a message, guys. Hold on. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so all questions are going to be welcome. We are sponsored by my bud vase. They have beautiful pieces, vintage, like one of a kind, just like gorgeous things and so actually oh there's going to be some exciting news about that but i won't i won't i won't say anything about that just yet but actually tomorrow is doreen's birthday and she is the owner of my bug base and so i wanted to just say happy early birthday and um all right let's get started i'm just rambling you know I did have to have my medicine prior to this and I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. <laughs> Let's get uh, Jess in here. So I have a lot of things I want to ask her and I know that you guys are going to want to ask her some things as well. Where is she? Is it working? Sorry, everybody. Having a little technical difficulty. Having some technical difficulties. What is the mass of the sun? We have a question already. Wow. Guys, I don't know if I can handle that. Hold on one second, everybody. Sorry. Yeah, but actually send your uh, questions to the question thing below. This is like, I'm just rolling with it, you know. I have my medicine. I have some questions about uh, legalization. We also had a, a little sneaky surprise added to the New Jersey legalization uh, for a little bit of decrim for psychedelics. So that was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> was not expecting that at all. Yay, she's here now. Thanks, Ange. All right. Got some questions. Oh, did we go? There. Hello. Oh, hello. Hey, how's it going? Everybody can hear me all right? I can hear you. Perfect. Can you hear me? You can yep. hear me on the phone. All right. How are you today? Good, good, good. You know, just uh, I feel like I've been in a black hole since legalization happened. So it's a lot, a lot going on. <laughs> it's like it seemed like a lot of people came out of the woodworks and just like it was an explosion of like questions and everything and just people were waiting. 
yeah, but there's still there's still a lot of, you know, uncertainty, a lot of unclarity um, happening, you know, so I've just been trying to keep myself as surprised and in the know as possible and just trying to get the information out to people. Yes, definitely. And that's why I w I'm actually really, really glad um, that you would join us today because there's just there's a, a ton of uh, nobody knew where exactly to find any of these uh you know what what actually was in this bill and then i guess uh what was it uh s21 is that what it is yeah so in the senate it's s21 in the assembly it's a21 okay um and and that took a lot of people by surprise that could you actually just explain uh, what i'm talking about better than i'm talking about it <laughs> yeah sure sure so you know, last year, for folks who were kind of really involved in the New Jersey scene last year, 2703 was the legalization bill that was on the table that didn't pass right in May. And so what A21 S21 is, it's just a mirror version of 2703 with a few added provisions in there. I would say it's anything from about 90% 2703. And they just took it, they resurrected it, they recycled it, they added a few more um, components into it. Um, and that's really the legalization bill that we have now. Um, and so it was introduced um, the Friday right after um, the election, which was very quick. And it was introduced at about six, seven o'clock at night with a committee hearing scheduled for 10 o'clock a.m. on a Monday. The bill is all of 207 pages. You're looking at 95,000 words. Um, but I was able to actually go through it fairly quickly because I was very familiar with 2703 before. And they actually underline for you what are the new additions um, in the bill. So that's the current bill that we have right now. It passed out of the first committee, but it needs to go to to through two other ones, um, really before it hits the Senate and the Assembly floor for a vote. Um, and so last week on Monday was the first committee hearing that we had on it. Um, and what I did was I assembled a group of folks, a group of activists who were really involved in policy. And I brought them together, I sounded the alarms because once I got word that it, the enabling legislation was gonna be 2703, just 2.0, I became really concerned because 2703 didn't have a lot of the social equity provisions that a lot of folks have been talking about, right? Um, so I rang the alarms, I organized a group of folks, we all came and we testified on Monday collectively as a group, um, each person kind of having you know, their own twist to it because we all come from different backgrounds. Um, and then there was supposed to be another one on Thursday that we were all gonna go testify against as well, but they pulled it from both the Senate and the Assembly Committee meetings because they needed to still do a bit more work on it. So currently right now, there is no rescheduling date. You know, I checked today um, on the state legislative website, which everybody should be checking now from time to time because that's where they post the bills, it's where they post the meetings. Um, but currently right now, there is no um, scheduled committee hearing just yet because we're getting word that they stopped it, um, the progress of it, because of social equity activists who really came out um, against um, the lack of social equity provisions in there. And so what I want to make clear to everybody is when I organized this group, it wasn't meant to stop the bill completely. It's meant to amend the bill. It's so that we can say we don't have, you know, we don't, we have a problem with X, Y, and Z, not the rest of it. But when you, when you call a bill, the most progressive bill in the country, and you call it a social equity bill, but the word social equity doesn't appear once, then there's a huge disconnect. And that's a huge problem. And that's where we're at now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, because what I was understanding uh, from the information that came out was that, you know, it was definitely uh, we were going to be reallocating funds to uh, police. Yep. Which was like the anti-equity, <laughs> um, yeah. if I had ever seen one. And so uh, what what were some of the provisions that actually people were hoping to see uh, for, for New Jersey specifically, just because that's where we are. But, but what were some of the things that you were hoping to see that, that were excluded? Yes, yeah, so the first part was, I was expecting to see the definition of what a social equity applicant would actually be, right? If the really the uh, huge purpose behind this is to make whole the people who were harmed by cannabis prohibition, the majority amount being black and Latino people, then why is there not a clear definition that this, you know, these programs that are 
proposed in the bill are going to actually be for, right? So what they actually did was they called it uh, folks, communities from socially and economically disadvantaged communities without a ever actually putting a definition to what that means, right? And when you use that type of broad language, that doesn't help our case, that helps their case, right? Um, and so we wanted to see a, a, a cohesive social equity program, a formal one, the same way that Massachusetts has it, the same way Colorado has it, Washington, Illinois, California, you name it. They all actually had, this is what a social equity applicant is, these are the requirements to qualify as such, and these are the programs specifically designated for social equity applicants. And that can come in the form of you'll get priority, you get, you know, a 25% increase um, in points for the licensing, you know, you get, you're available to have, you know, grants, you're available to have priority in terms of licenses such in Massachusetts, where only social equity applicants who reside in Massachusetts are able to have delivery types of licenses. Those are social equity programs. We, there is none of that in the proposed legislation right now. Uh, the second thing is we did wanna see the allocation of tax revenue going towards the social equity program, right? But then there's mm -hmm. the issue. If there is no social equity program contemplated, then where could these funds actually go, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, the way the tax revenue is set up, it has three buckets. So the first one is just for the oversight and regulation of the commission and the expansion of the medical cannabis program. The mm -hmm. second one is a portion of, of tax revenue is going to go towards law enforcement training, right? And then the last bucket is all remaining money will go to the state general fund. So there's actually no sort of earmarking for this type of money to go towards any sort of programs that would help those harmed by prohibition, right? And the argument could be made, well, it could go into the first bucket where it's kind of a more generalized definition of right, it's going to go towards the oversight regulation of the commission, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen in other states, when there is no specific language explicitly providing for tax allocation to those, communi to those communities, mm -hmm. then we don't see that. So the way that I structured it in my written testimony, which is available for public viewing if anybody's interested, but I broke it down really into kind of three layers, right? Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, the first thing is we need to enact what a social equity applicant is. Then the next part is we need to redefine what an impact zone is and build upon what an impact zone is for a social equity applicant. And the third is tax revenue going towards specifically for social equity applicants for the social equity program mandated to be created by the commission. Those were my recommendations to go in there because you can't have, you know, just tax revenue. And even if they say, you know, tax revenue is going to go towards socially and economically disadvantaged communities, like what is that? Like, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what that is. Right. I looked through 200 and something pages and I couldn't find the definition. So you can have this money and you can say it's going to be allocated towards these communities. But if they're not explicitly defined, then how are we ever even going to keep them accountable for funneling that money towards these programs anyways? So it's, it's a bit nuanced. It's a bit layered. But the best place to look for is just what is missing. Right. And the blatant thing that is missing is an actual social equity program. Oh, yeah, no, that that's definitely, uh, you know, and as much as I, I don't follow everything to a T or at all, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was just, I knew that there was going to have to be a fight, but for the things that have seemed to come up uh, lacking and wanting uh, for this, you know, it, it seems doable. This definitely seems doable. Um, the fact that, you know, it hasn't been rescheduled kind of, I feel, gives people more of the opportunity. I know uh, Mary Pryor, she had uh, started a petition yep. um, as well uh, for that. Yep. And so, yeah, so Mary, Mary was one of the, the people that I brought into this uh, when I created this kind of uh, kind of just a very, just a group of people that I called upon, you know, on the Thursday before it was introduced to really testify, you know, against us. And Mary Pryor was one of them, you know, and she kind of, you know, took the reins on a lot of stuff and, you know, put out this petition, right? Dashita, Dashita Dawson also, you know, with the coalition that she formed with the regulators of color, they also um, put forth a letter and their recommendations as well. So did Minorities for Medical Marijuana. And we're also working with MCBA as well. So we do have folks kind of coming in from different parts of the country, you know, anywhere from operators to regulators to lawyers to folks really kind of in, you know, the marketing fight. Um, we brought all of those folks together 
because we need a cohesive voice, right? And so right now I'm getting a lot of questions. How can I help? How can I help? What, you know, what, what can I do now? And the best thing that really you can do is one is you can familiarize yourself with the enabling legislation that is being proposed, right? Now, if you don't wanna read through 200 pages of, of legal language, completely understandable, I would then recommend folks to go view uh, the first committee hearing that took place on this bill last Monday, a week ago on the 9th, because it is available on the state legislative website and you're able to watch the whole Zoom. So you can see me talk, you can see Leo talk, you can see Nadir talk, Mary talk, Dashita talk, and all of us are really hitting on kind of the same points. And right now what we need is we need more voices, right? Everybody mm -hmm. used their, you know, their vote as their voice for cannabis legalization. Now I need folks to get louder because that was just the beginning. That wasn't the end of the fight, right? And I think a lot of people have that in their minds that once it passed, it was just gonna be, you know, shoe in, game over, that's it. We can kick back and relax. And I kept having to, you know, to tell folks, this is where we fight. This is where it starts, right? Because mm -hmm. if they're not gonna really know, there's gonna, there's a huge disconnect always, right? Between kind of legislators or constituency, especially the cannabis community. So we need to help bridge that gap. We need to let them know if you're calling this the most progressive bill in the country, please take a look at Illinois. Please take a look at Washington. And then you'll quickly realize why you can never, by any stretch of the imagination, call this a progressive bill. So there are going to be further opportunities. Folks are going to have at least two or three more opportunities to either provide mm -hmm. written testimony, oral testimony, or if you want to go in person to the Senate, um, even better, um, but understanding that it's COVID. Um, and so that, that may not be a lot of opportunity for a lot of folks. And truthfully, I find it pretty dumb that they are requiring certain folks to go in to testify in the middle of a pandemic on a medicinal plant. Um, mm -hmm. Whole other conversation, but there <laughs> are going to be opportunities for people to do so. So if you don't feel comfortable speaking up in front of, you know, and having it be public and forever in the legislative records, then you can write something. And I've had folks say, what should I write? What should I write? And I need people to understand that I can't tell you what to write, but just think about what type of business you want, what type of opportunities you want. If the one thing that, you know, maybe your business is lacking is education, then tell them that you want the state to provide education. If you mm -hmm. don't have the funds, tell them that you you want funds to be able to start this operation. If you can say, I don't have access to professional services, let them know this is what you need, right? You're going to understand your business or your business model way better than the legislators will because the legislators have a hundred issues going on at one time that they have to keep apprised of. If you're narrowly focused on your own business, then you know what's best. And these are your opportunities to speak up and they have to listen to you, right? We elected them. This is, the, this is their job and this is the whole point of having public committee hearings. Yes. Um, you just, you reminded me of something um, and I had wanted to ask you this, but do you feel like it was, and this is a no offense to her, but it was kind of like a cop out from the social equity to uh, propose a woman of color as the head of the commission for this uh, new cannabis regulatory? Like, yeah. So I, I noticed that. <laughs> so yeah, so so we're talking about Diana Wainu. Um, truthfully, I was I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Um, I know mm -hmm. Diana. Um, we're both in the same organization, the New Leaders Council. Um, both alums of it. Um, she's fantastic, but she she worked with the ACLU right for for a while. Um, on these same you know sorts of issues. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was both, you know, I think it was a very strategic move on their part to place a woman of color who has experience in criminal reform, who has actually, you know, helped craft a lot of, you know, this language to really oversee it. And I think it's kind of those situations where it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't type of thing, right? <laughs> um, and so while not everybody's going to, you know, maybe particularly happy about that, but what folks should realize is that she gets it. You know, she's been in the industry. She understands it. And so she'll be willing to really, you know, have those open lines of, of communication. Obviously, well, I can't speak for Diana, but based on, you know, what she provided, you know, in reports um, and the day that she was appointed, she's willing to work with folks because she understands it from that side. Right. So now we have a regulator in charge of the mm -hmm. Cannabis Regulatory Commission 
whose her whole career was based on social rights and, and, and um, you know, civil rights and social equity and social justice and advocating for that. Mm -hmm. So personally for me, I was absolutely thrilled to see somebody like that on um, to, to, to head it because one, it's, it's not somebody who's coming outside of the cannabis industry, right? Which we've yeah. seen with somebody else who was already announced for it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a problem because then it becomes a matter of our taxpaying dollars are going to be spent teaching this person about the industry. And that's not my worry at all with Diana or Jeff Brown. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Once I saw that, you know, I, I obviously wanted to research her and I saw uh, ACLU, I'm like, all right, they, they're trying. It just was a shock to me that that was, that you would have somebody that would have so much to offer and then have missed out on offering the actual things um, to the people. Uh, let me actually take a step back away from the social equity. And I want to talk because you are uh, an IP. Uh, you work intellectual property, everybody. <laughs> so I, I wear a whole bunch of hats. <laughs> so there are people who were really thinking that, okay, legalization is going to happen. I'm going to launch my Canna brand. Like this is just going to happen for me. Um, a lot of the things that I saw were just like uh, operating. And I like to refer to them as street pharmacists uh, <laughs> operating as a street pharmacist and thinking that it was just going to be this seamless uh jump over into okay now I have a brand and things like that what what can you offer to those people as like since we're kind of in limbo right now like what do they need to be doing uh in order to just start this whole process of becoming a legitimate uh business sure and so we're talking about those who want to enter the plant touching business yes enter okay yeah sure um, so probably the best place to start off at is there are going to be six different types of licenses. Um, so 2703 only contemplated four. Now we have six, right? So that's cultivation, processing, um, wholesale, retail, delivery, and I believe the other one's distribution. Um, and that one's more a kind of packaging large amounts. Um, so there are going to be these six different types of licenses that you'll be able to, you know, apply for. The only cap right now on licenses is for cultivation, which is currently capped at 28 cultivators, right? Mm -hmm. Where they got that number, I'm not really sure. But that's the only cap that there is available. So the legislation actually doesn't provide for caps in any other, um, in any other license type, right? And mm -hmm. so we're not going to see the, um, you know, any sort of requests for applications for adult use, probably for quite some time, because what ends up needs to happen is the commission needs to be sat. Mm -hmm. The commission then needs to come out with regulations. There needs to be a public comment for those regulations. And then those regulations are actively enacted. And then they have a certain amount of time before they can really start accepting, you know, um, licenses. So there are kind of folks on one side who are advocating so that they are not competitive licenses, right? So that it's mm -hmm. just kind of similar in the similar vein as any other industry where you can just say, well, I meet the criteria X, Y, and Z. I should just automatically get a license as opposed to let us compare you to 200 multi-state operators who are trying to come into the industry. And that's a more competitive round, right? And that requires a lot more capital. It requires a lot more human capital as well. Um, and so I would say for folks who are really, you know, trying to figure out where they want to land in this space, you have time on your side. And that's really the advantage here is we already know the types of licenses that are coming out. The requirements for each type are laid out in the enabling legislation. They'll probably be built upon more by the commission once that's formed, but the basic outline of what they're requiring is already included in the enabling legislation. So you can go take a look at that and basically just say, okay, I have this, I have this, I don't have that. Um, probably the biggest uh, barrier to entry, of course, no surprise to anybody, is going to be the amount of capital needed to enter the space, right? Um, and so that's going to be, um, it's going to be a hefty price, especially if it's competitive. Um, if they decide to go the non-competitive route, I think fees will be a little less at that point, but nothing so substantial. Um, mm -hmm. But the best thing that people can really do right now is figure out which type of license they want to apply for, look at the requirements that they have, and if it's, an, if it's a type of license where your location is very, very important, 
then I would urge folks to start making relationships in those municipalities, right? Because what you don't want to run into is you don't want to set your, uh, your eyes and your heart on a location, and then you're actually not able to go into it because the city council has never heard of you, the constituents of that city have never heard of you, the police department has never heard of you. So it becomes a, a game of, you know, you kind of have to figure out where you want to be and start creating almost like a brand name for yourself within, you know, that sort of community. Talking mm -hmm. to your councilman, let them know, I want to, you know, I want to create this cannabis operation here and I'm willing to bring folks to educate, um, you know, the, the, the population of the city and I'm willing to present and I'm willing to, you know, show you X, Y, and Z. Because what's going to end up happening is these applications are going to drop fairly quickly and you don't really want to be left catching up. So right now, since we don't have a current application period, start looking where you want to be and start making yourselves known, right? Because mm -hmm. a portion of the application on the past two applications, a portion of it was a community impact plan. And you got 30 points if you were able to provide a community impact plan. So it's much stronger on an application to say, I've done X, Y, and Z, as opposed to I plan to do X, Y, and Z, right? Because then you're known, then the city council knows who you are. When it comes time for zoning hearings, you know, you're going to have folks on your side, folks who already know who you are, instead of you popping up out of nowhere of, hey, you know, I want to set up something in Jersey City, uh, but those councilmen have never heard of you. That just becomes a bit of a more uphill battle. So I would say the best thing that you can do right now, figure mm -hmm. out your location, if, if it's a location-centric license, and start creating, you know, a sort of brand name, a brand awareness, right? Jade, like the way that you've done for yourself, right? Is like, you've mm -hmm. created a lot of educational programs, you've been involved, you know, in your community doing what you need to do. And now it's almost just taking that, leveraging it in the municipality that you want to be in and showing them that you're not just here to make money off of the community, but you're here to invest in that community. And that I think is going to be very, very strong and that a lot of people really take for granted. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely the, I, I'm going to agree with you on that. And the whole giving back to the community right now is what they're like, we're in a time right now where people really need whatever you can give them. So just as a brand in your location, make sure that you are giving back um, and let them know about the educational opportunities that you plan on providing, because there are going to be, I, I already know from working, you know, uh, and just seeing at Garden State Hemp, we did an Elementa event and they saw the woman in weed sign outside. And it was like this whole thing, like they're trying to sell drugs and everything. Mm -hmm. Like, and we're like, no, okay, you got to have like, you got to do coat drives, food drives, you got to do stuff for the community, let them know who you are, let them know who you are as a brand. Because um, like I had spoke to somebody else, and this actually is another question I would like to pose to you, but they're thinking of starting a cannabis uh, with maybe considering to have like alcohol, thinking maybe that was uh, like a seamless transition. And I'm not too sure how a community would perceive that because even though it is going to be adult use that we're coming up on, um, how do you feel, how do you see people that are in the alcohol uh, industry, you know, maybe they own a bar or something like that, you know, would that be a seamless transition for them, do you find? So, so this is the probably the trickiest part of any sort of application is going to be, you need to show experience with legal cannabis, right? Mm. And so it's one of those catch 22s of like, well, how am I supposed to have experience in a non legalized state, right? It's like when you graduate from college, and they're like, you need five years of experience. And you're like, well, how am I supposed to get five years of experience? I just graduated. So mm -hmm. right now on the for the application types, it does require you, I think, absent from delivery and wholesale, it does, but don't quote me on that, but it does ask for an operating summary. And within that operating summary, you have to provide what is your experience? Like, let's say going for, um, a, you know, a, a dispensary. So what is your experience dispensing legal cannabis, right? And so if you don't have that, that's going to be a loss, you know, on a lot of points, right? Um, and so the way that people have done it in the past is you partner up with out of state operators, they don't have to be a multi state operators, but you partner with out of state operators, so that they bring over their standard operating procedures, they bring over folks who maybe will be your, you know, your dispensary manager, they bring over their intellectual property for you to use. Um, and then that's a way to really get those points. Um, 
But it is, once again, just a barrier to entry because what if you don't have, you know, the connections to connect with an out-of-state operator and, you know, persuade them to come into New Jersey or partner up with you or teaming up with you? Either way, you're going to have to give up a portion of your business to be able to get those points, right? So if you are, though, however, you know, in the alcohol industry, which is, once again, very, very regulated, you'll still be able to use that on your application because you're going to understand what it's like to work in an industry that is regulated where tons of compliance is necessary. And so you'll, you should be able to capitalize on that, right? Um, because in past applications, they've, they've asked for, you know, either cannabis experience or experience in any other regulated industry, such as pharmaceuticals, financials, et cetera. Alcohol absolutely falls underneath that. Um, and I would just say, you know, start looking, start really building out your team and look for folks with that type of experience um, because it's all going to need to be translated on an application. And just think about how many they're going to review and who they're going to choose. They want this to, su to succeed, right? And so they're going to choose really applicants that are most successful and a lot of times that's going to really alienate the minority community especially those who were harmed um, by mm -hmm. prohibition right to kind of bring social equity back into the conversation it's that, that's one other um, really barrier to entry so I would say for folks if you have you know experience in a regulated industry absolutely it's going to be very very useful but you're really going to start thinking about um you know, partnering up with with other 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 state operators from out of state, so you can be able to provide that type of experience on the application. At this moment, you know, I'm not sure if they're going to do. You know, let's say like one of my things that I actually I proposed my written testimony was, well, the commission should provide education, you know, on cannabis and the business of it, the legalities of it, X, Y, and Z, and then that mm -hmm. should count as experience. You should be able then to get points for experience based on you know, the type of education that they're going to be providing you or else we're just going to, we're just going to be, um, you know, an industry filled with out of state folks who are just going to come into New Jersey and just capitalize on this market. When I do think a huge emphasis should be on local entrepreneurs who have lived here and who have been doing the work. Yes, definitely. And I mean, not for nothing, this is the garden state, like, come on, guys. <laughs> come on, folks. We, 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 we have it. We have the green thumbs to do this. Like we, we have the savvy to do this. It's just um, right now it's going to be uh, a fight to kind of, to get these laws, these bills, uh, you know, up to code, up to par to what we need. Um, and also what, okay. What legalization would, what what is this bringing with people who are incarcerated like what what are we going to do then um what's that step even like yeah so you know there was an expungement bill that passed you know last year um it's still being worked through um but we do have a decriminalization bill there's actually two decrim bills um in committees which you know just to make matters even more confusing um for everybody but the one that recently passed was the one that decriminalized six ounces or less um mm -hmm. you know in terms of possession um in terms of distribution i, I forgot what the language was within there but it it does also decriminalize small amounts of distribution as well. Um, but also, you know, in terms of, you know, bringing folks who were incarcerated for it and bringing them into the legal industry, there's currently really no pathways for that. Um, you know, part of um, on last year's application, that was just kind of um, something you could have done is, you know, you write a plan about how you also plan to hire folks um, who were incarcerated for cannabis, and you got extra points for that. But there really isn't a clear cut pathway for, hey, you know, your life was potentially destroyed because of this cannabis arrest. And there is really no, sh you know, avenue for you then to go into the legal market, right? And so there are certain felonies and certain um, records that are not, that you actually would be able to get on an application with, um, but there's different thresholds depending on the type of, um, you know, uh, arrest, uh, your, your crime record. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's still, it's not very clear cut, right? And that's where a social equity program comes into place because my, you know, the, I took the definition of social equity from the Washington bill. And it just states, you know, you're a social equity applicant if, you know, if you've either lived in one of these areas, which called, you know, impact zones, or you've been arrested, a child has been arrested, or a spouse has been arrested, or a parent was arrested for it. 
And that way that narrowly centers this on, okay, now there's a pathway created, right? Because now you're specifically defined in a group that now is going to be funded through um, this tax revenue in order for these programs to exist, right? Anything from incubator programs to technical assistance, how to fill out an application, how to create a business plan to professional services, right? Having access to lawyers, having access to accountants, it's really expensive as well. But without a formal social equity program, it's once again, it's very hard to, per to create those, those avenues of opportunity for those communities because in the eyes of the way this legislation is, they don't exist. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's definitely, this is gonna be a, a big fight and we're not only fighting for us sitting here, but all the people that are still locked up for this because that is, it, it, just even with uh, medical cannabis, like access is ridiculous because it is not, it is not affordable or geared towards or accessible to the people that it needs to be for. And it's just always just something that like is, is mind boggling to me because it just is this healing natural plant. And now it's going to become a, as much as it's a necessity, unfortunately, because of society, it's become this like corporate, just like capitalistic money making thing. But yeah, exactly. And that's, that's why we need to, you know, we need folks to really, I, I keep saying, I'm like, people, please step into the arena, right? Yeah. I have, you know, I had people who prior to legalization passing, where, you know, I was getting a whole bunch of messages from folks, you know, um, saying, well, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna create the bill for this way. And we don't have any power and we don't have any say. And mm -hmm. I outwardly reject that sentiment. I yeah. reject the fact that we don't have a say in this, right? And I think the best thing to do is organize people, right? If you are in the cannabis space, and you've got a lot of friends in the cannabis space, not just in New Jersey, but around the country, organize mm -hmm. them, tell them what's going on, kind of in the same way that I did last, you know, last week. And I just texted a few people, will you get on the phone with me and talk about what's happening and testify with me? Will you yeah. back me up? I need backup. And so call for that backup because there are going to be opportunities and I'm going to try my best to keep everybody apprised in, in real time of, of what's going on. But we, you know, if you have, you know, we had, I think over 40, maybe 50 people testifying against a 21 as 21 on Monday. So yeah. if we can have more, imagine what that would look like if we had 150 people all arguing the same thing. We need a social equity program. We need tax revenue to go directly for us. We need pathways for those incarcerated to get into this legal industry. We need education. We need grants. We need X, Y, and Z. If, every, if everybody keeps hitting those same exact points over and over and over again, to them, they're going to say, oh, wait, this isn't something outrageous because our constituency wants it. And you know what the big difference is between now and maybe before when your legislators weren't listening? Now there's data. Now there's data that this, that New Jersey residents want this. It passed by 67%, making it the most successful cannabis campaign in the country, in the history, in the US, right? So every county voted in favor of cannabis. So these legislators now have data that my constituency voted in overwhelmingly amounts where they didn't have that data before. So, a, so clearly now you see for all of those legislators who voted no last year, now you can see that disconnect. But now there's data that we can work with and we say, um, actually, hi, you represent Hudson County. Hudson County passed by almost a 70%. So yes. our residents want this, we want it, but this is the way that we want it. So I really do urge folks that because we have that data, I think legislators are a lot less likely to kind of tiptoe around the idea or ignore it because they can mm -hmm. no longer ignore it, right? We all voted for it. We all use our voices or vote. We just need to continue to do that as these kind of committee hearings continue and there will be more. And like I said, it's, we're just gonna be so much stronger um, in numbers because clearly, you know, it just took all of 20 people to really kind of halt the progress of the bill. Now imagine what a hundred people can do. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So that that's actually something I plan on being a little bit more vocal on um, just because it, it I, I really feel like it fell flat and the fact that they were pushing to rush the program 
uh, there was all this like hype that, oh, cannabis is going to be right. legal, available for purchase. And I'm like, you don't even have enough for the medical patients. So I don't know where you were going to get stuff. for Disconnect, <laughs> you see, disconnect, disconnect, right? And so we can't rely on our legislators. I tell people all the time, participate in your own rescue, right? Mm -hmm. So get into that arena and start letting them know because they just may not be aware. And while you, we can fault our legislators all we want, but we have to remember who we're working with, who we're dealing with. Folks who have a hundred issues on their table, not just cannabis, but I work primarily in cannabis. This is pretty much, you know, 90% of my clients are cannabis, hemp, or CBD. This is all I do every day in and out. So I have that really kind of background knowledge and experience to help them with, right? And I think if we come to the table as, hey, you know, we're not trying to really stop your party, but we want to be invited to this party and this is how we do it. I think, you know, that's going to create a lot more progress rather than a whole lot of people rah, 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 and saying, you know, this bill is trash and we should end it. Um, mm -hmm. That's not going to get us anywhere because people need to realize we have a deadline of January 1st. January 1st, the Constitution of New Jersey changes automatically to legalize cannabis. So they need to have enabling legislation because if not, it legalizes in New Jersey and we're operating in a free for all market. I mean, like I could sell out of my house on, on January 1st if there is no enabling legislation attached to it. Mm -hmm. So that's the deadline that we're looking at. That's why they're trying to push it so quickly. And that's why we need to act as quickly as they are. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that, that January 1st, I mean, we definitely need some laws then because it, we need to speak up because whatever they push on us isn't going to be, it is going to be trash. So taking the streets right now, you're absolutely, I'll agree with you on that as well, that it's not, that's not, that's not going to help at this point. Like we need to give these, these out of touch people the actual ideas so that we can get this going because people have been talking about this for so long. I reposted an article from what, like three years ago where they're like, cannabis will be legal next year. And I'm like, right. Four years later. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And then we got to say, take into consideration, right? A lot of these legislators, like especially, you know, Senator Scutari, he's been putting a lot of effort really behind this, right? He's been the guy really steerheading and propelling this forward. So now it's just come to a point where, you know, they want their W's. They want mm -hmm. to see this pass. And so, and they wanted to do it quickly, right? So if you, if you took a look at like articles from two weeks ago, right, as you were saying, Jade, like everybody was like, this is going to happen now. And we're going to have legal cannabis immediately. And then all of a sudden, a week later, the tune changed to, well, you know, we need to go through different iterations of the bill and the process and see that. And that type of difference is because they realize that they're not going to be able to really ramrod this legislation through as seamlessly mm -hmm. as they thought they did. But at the mm -hmm. same time, they don't need us to pass this bill. Mm -hmm. So they can pass it really. And they're going to try to move. And I really can't emphasize this point enough. They're going to move very, very, very quickly. So mm -hmm. we need to be able to respond and be able to be a little bit more proactive. Right. And so, you know, I've provided written language for them. I've provided them with, um, you know, an outline of this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to be included. I've given it to them like this. Mm -hmm and said, this is how you can change it, right? And folks are going to come at it differently, which I think is okay. But as long yeah. as we keep hitting the same points, you know, I think we'll, I, th I think we'll get to something that eventually, you know, we'll all want to see. It's not going to be perfect. No. At all, right? It's not going to be perfect. But the beauty of the legislative process is it can always be amended, right? But I think right now we need to start off on a strong foundation. So we may not be able to get everything we want up front, but we should set up the foundation for us to build upon that. Yes. Um, can I uh, just ask a question about something that is not cannabis? Sure. What's good with this like decrim of psychedelics? What? <laughs> it came out. Of, it definitely, um, definitely came out of, of nowhere. Um, you know, and what the thing is, I need to also say it's because I've seen a lot of information. Everybody's like, hey, they decriminalized uh, psilocybin. No, they did not. It is not decriminalized at all. They just lowered the penalties. Yeah, they just oh. lowered the penalties. So now if you're caught with an ounce or less of psilocybin, all you can get really, and it's not all because it's still something on your record, is a disorderly person's offense. Okay. So okay. that so okay. they they just minimize the penalties for it, but they didn't decriminalize it outright. <laughs> so, so please, everybody, don't 
take any golden caps and just be free. It's we're not we're not free like that just yet. And the same thing applies to cannabis. Please do not just because we have it, you know, we all agreed does not mean that you can just go around and do as you please with cannabis right now. So please hold off. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. Because I get this question all the time. Like, so can I go outside and smoke now? No. Um, right. We're going to be still subject to kind of think about it like alcohol, right? You can buy alcohol at a bar, but you can't be drinking it on the street. So just take a look at like open container laws. It's going to be really something different. Um, it's going to be something kind of, sorry, uh, sorry, around the same thing as that. Um, so yeah, so ne definitely not just yet. Really, you know, we can probably get this legalized beforehand with this enabling legislation. But really, mm -hmm. after January 1st is really when you know, you'll be, you know, all good. But, you know, there are still going to be a lot of restrictions. The municipalities are going to be able to enact the restrictions that they want versus where you can consume, what you can consume, how much you can consume, where you can consume. So it's just really important that people stay vigilant um, of really, one, their rights, um, but also what they can still be um, arrested for. Because this doesn't really go far enough in terms of, you know, a lot of police interaction kind of stopping, you know, smell will no longer be probable cause. So, you know, nobody, a cop can't come by you and just sniff you and say, oh, you have cannabis on you, I'm going to arrest you, right? They have to assume yeah. that you obtained it legally. So what I would just tell folks is, you know, keep it in your, your, your package bags, make sure that you have it, you know, if it's from a dispensary that you bought it, that it's, you know, in some sort of casing um, as well. Um, but it is not going to be this kind of free for all, you know, we're going to go all smoke outside and it's going to be you know, a, a cloud of smoke type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. We still do need to be vigilant because it's going to take some time really before we get anywhere near where the West Coast is at. Mm -hmm. We got to remember, like, we're still in Jersey, right? We're still a hard on crime type of type of city, right? Police unions like run. So mm -hmm. just make sure that, you know, you're just apprised of what's happening and what's going on in your town. Um, you know, call your council people and ask them. You know, what are my rights within here? You know, can I smoke outside? Can I not? What's going on? Yes, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, so we're coming to an end. I know I had asked you and you said you didn't have any workshops or boot camps or anything like that, but could you just let everybody know where they normally could find any of your... Uh, information and educational services and things. Yeah, like that. sure. Uh, so I, I think primarily it's a uh, my my Instagram. Um, my website is almost done. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll be revealing that um, in the next few weeks. Um, and then that'll be a place where everybody can really kind of keep tabs on what I'm doing, what I'm where I'm going. Um, but my Instagram, so at Canabogada, um, and then um, a couple of places you know that I will be. Uh, there'll be the Jersey City Green Rush event that's happening on December first, and I'll be speaking on that. Um, and I'll also be speaking at MJ Biz as well on a social equity panel along with Dashita Dawson, um, along with um, Amber Center um, and Wanda James. And so we'll actually be we're actually going to be able to get a couple of free tickets for folks that want to attend it. And we'll be we're going to start gifting them out um, specifically for women of color in the space. So stay tuned for that. All right. Awesome. So whenever you get that information, we will post it wherever so that everybody can tune in and just like learn from you because you are a wealth of knowledge and again thank you so much for coming on today and thank you to my bud vase and happy birthday doreen thank you for sponsoring the show uh and we will be back soon and everybody follow jess immediately <laughs> <laughs> yes and thank you so much thank you for inviting me jade it's, it's been a while so i'm happy to see yeah. your face yes thank you well everybody i hope you have a happy monday and I'll see you next time. And this video will be posted. So if you miss part of it, it's going to be up here for you. Okay. Take care, everybody. Adios. <laughs>